Okay, so the first feature that's uh, been changed is the advanced find. Um, this is how it worked before. You could match all the properties. So in this case, I've got description. It has to have Bach somewhere in the description. It also has to have low somewhere in the description. So there you can see there's a Bach, there's a low. And for every one of these, there'll be a low Bach. Uh, it's all in there somewhere. There's low. It's going to be a barking in there somewhere. Anyway, so the option now is to go any. So this is going to do a or search. What was working before was a and search. So this is just saying bring back all the records where description has bark somewhere in there, or bring back all the records that have low in the description. So you can see it's got low in here, there's low there. You've still got your ones with box and low in there, but it's just a way to sort of uh, expand things out a bit more. All right, for the next little feature here, we're going to do a little lookup of metadata. So these four sound files have all the metadata stripped out of them. You can see there's absolutely nothing in there. And they come from the ambient isolation project. So all I have to do is select my files, hit E to edit. This is the manufacturer ID that matches up with this. This is just to stop any sort of collisions that might happen on the metadata server. So by saying it's the, from the ambient isolation uh, library or um, collection, I suppose you can call it, it knows now when it goes and builds its fingerprint to only look for matching records that are from the ambient isolation. So that just sort, sort of like makes sure there's no collisions that are going to happen. Anyway, so I just go to the database menu and I'm going to say look up the metadata from the cloud. And it will just kind of plow through, and you can see it's pulled down pretty much all of the artwork, all of the artwork, all of the metadata um, for those sound files that I have. And from there, I could rebuild the file names if I wanted to using like the UCS field build. I'll just do that. Cool. Run it. So there we are. I want to show the files, and then I would just embed them back. So that's a way for vendors to sort of update you uh, once you've once you've actually bought their sounds. So when you've got their sounds live in the field rather than have to mess around with text sheets or anything like that. Um, they can notify you that it's up on the metadata server, any changes you might need to make to the manufacturer field. And once you've done that, you can just get it crunching away on those files. There's only a few vendors, uh, probably 10, I think, right now that have uh, uploaded their their metadata for their collections. Um, but obviously, hope more people come on board because it's a pretty useful little feature. OK, now we'll talk about some stuff that's inside Radium, so voice stealing. Um, by default, there's 48 voices per slot, which means if I just you know, crank my release up a little bit and then play the sound, I can get 48 going in a row before it will start doing some, some voice stealing. Um, so I can lower this down. Let's lower it down to something like six. And you'll see, I'll keep whacking away on the keyboard. I'm still whacking away, but there's only ever six playing. Move it to two. Now you can see it's getting a little clicky there. The idea is mainly you would use this when the layers get really complicated, and it's just really building up the sound, and you just need a way to quickly mute some of those older voices. I'm probably going to do some stuff to try and get rid of those little clicks as well in the future. Anyway, but that's uh, that's voice stealing. Okay, now we'll talk about a new lo-fi plugin called Downgrade. So this is one of the built-in effects inside Radium. Um, with it off, turn it on. So you can get some good glitchy 8-bit uh, kind of sounds out of that. And always remember, you can rearrange these. So if I wanted to have that sound go into reverb, but if I swap them around now, it's going to be reverbed getting downgraded. fun. All right, next we're going to talk about using Radium as a sort of a clip editor. 
a way to sort of build up a scene or build up perhaps a, a layered weapon or monster sound or whatever it is that you want to do. So that's my original sound and I pitched it down an octave. I'll just go here and we'll load this sound in. This one's also well, it's picked up, uh, pitched down two octaves and I'm going to delay it a little bit. There we are. And I could keep on going doing the things that I want to do. And then there's a little button up here called export to Reaper. So I click and drag this. And there is uh, basically what I had inside Radium uh, pulled into Reaper. But you can see if I go to the item properties, what's pretty cool about it is it's using the original um, sound file, but it's set the playback rate to match. So in this case, the first sound was down an octave. So it's half the playback rate. And in this one, because I went down two octaves, it's a quarter of the rate. It's also put the delay in that I put inside um, Radium. And because it's the original sound, just turn snapping off here, there is the entire sound file there. So there's the three sounds. There is a bit more in this one, but you can see it would be these ones. One, two, three. That's what matches up. So what gets uh, what gets translated? Well, if you've reverse sounds inside uh, Soundminer, so let's reverse this one. There we go. And I'll just export to Reaper again. I'll just drag it on to open it up as a project. You can see that this one is reversed right there. So reverse is uh, taking into consideration all of the tuning as far as octaves, semitones, and sense. The uh, overall amplitude or gain is uh, ported over as well as the delay. None of the effects or any of the, these things are taken into consideration because in, you know if you're going to use those, you pretty much have to render it out, make a recording. But this is just a quick way to use Radium to see how some layers are going to sound. And then instantly open it up inside Reaper. And then you can do things like panning and time stretching and all the stuff that Reaper's great at. All right, we'll just talk about the modulation section here. I had to change quite a lot of the code underneath to get all this working, but lots of little improvements. So I can assign a MIDI controller, like 21, assign it to the stereo panner. We'll go to pen on this one. And you can see as I move my controller, it moves as well. So nothing's changed there, but on another slot now, I can use the same controller, assign it to a different place entirely, and it's going to be moving this as well. Before it was only working on the, the layer that you were currently viewing, but now you can do it to multiple. That also, if that is my target one, yeah, controller 21, if I roll over a control, so let's go roll over dry here and I'll hit T to target. So now it's actually controlling two parameters. So it's using 21 to go to the amount, and it's using whatever I had targeted to go to the dry. I can also do it this way as well. So I could go 21 to uh, go stereo panner. Or not. Yeah, that will do. So you can see all three of them are moving now, but of course I can invert this one. To, why don't I move it so that we can actually see what's going on. Uh, stereo panner, move it down to the shifter. There we go. So you can see as this one goes down, these go up. It's going down, and this one's coming up. That's what the inverse version does. And then I can restrict the range as well to only have it modulate just a certain range. And that works for other things too. I really improved the like the random generator. So if you assign the random generator to two places, you only get the controls, which is the smoothing and the speed on one of them, one of the entries. So lots of little things improve there.